Today we're talking about a Supreme Court case that just crosses so many different political fault lines. What if I told you that a federal law enforcement officer shot and killed an unarmed Mexican teenager from across the border? I mean, where do you even start with this one? It feels like there are probably a few laws that were broken here, and uh, did we just attack Mexico? What the court was trying to figure out is what, if anything, should be done to this officer. Now, This could sound like a case I picked out just to get everybody a little angrier at everybody else, because that's the news media's job these days, isn't it? In fact, this case has very broad implications for what actions can be protected regarding all federal officers, including Customs and Border Patrol, ICE, and potentially even drone pilots, depending on how vague the justices decide to be. Now, Before we get into this case, let's get some context. In 2010, we saw Inside the coffin is a 15-year-old who U.S. authorities say began throwing a barrage of big stones at Border Patrol agents who were trying to detain illegal immigrants on the U.S. side of the Rio Grande. The teen was on the Mexico side of the border, and U.S. authorities say while he was just throwing stones, the agent who shot and killed him was defending himself and colleagues. Yeah, this is a sad situation we're dealing with. These Supreme Court episodes tend not to be a barrel of laughs. Why can't they just once take on the case of Puppies v Rainbows? In response to the shooting, the boy's parents sued for damages in civil court, arguing that Mesa had used excessive force against Sergio, which violated Sergio's rights under the Fourth and Fifth Amendments of the United States Constitution. Now, Some of you might be wondering, uh, this sounds like a crime, why isn't it being tried in criminal court? Well, the Defense Department came out on the side of the officer, arguing that, after an investigation, the victim was throwing rocks at the officer, so he was acting in self-defense. Now That probably seriously angers some of you, and I'm not sure if this makes things better or worse, but that was Obama's Department of Justice, so less problematic? According to them, his actions were in line with Border Patrol policy, so not a crime. Now this is where things get tricky, because this is now civil court we're talking about here, and suing for damages, well, it's an odd beast in the United States. What happens normally in a lawsuit is that the plaintiff starts the lawsuit by filing something called a complaint. The complaint is a pretty bare bones document. The standard is what's called notice pleading. You just have to put the defendant on notice of the general thing that you are alleging. The court will assume that all of the allegations in that complaint are absolutely true. Whatever the plaintiff said is true. Thank you to Legal Eagle and John Oliver's recent segment on slap suits for bringing that fun quirk to my attention. In this case, the complaint said that the kid wasn't throwing rocks, just playing. So that's the story that we're going with today. This is where you get moments in the oral arguments like this complaint, and at this stage, this very preliminary stage, we're supposed to accept the complaint's allegations as true which is that here we have a rogue officer acting in violation of the agency's own instruction, using excessive force to kill a child at play. Hoo-wee! This might surprise you, but we haven't even touched on the legal debate yet. This is all still context. So for the remainder of this case, the justices have to assume that the victim's story about playing, rather than the executive branch's recollection of throwing rocks at officers, is correct. If that sounds like a problem to you, especially on an international stage, well, you're not alone. Just Kagan, you really think that the next time we go in to talk to Mexico and we take a position on something at the border, they won't say, how is your representation credible? You told us last time that your officer didn't do anything wrong, and your own courts, potentially even your Supreme Court, told you you were wrong. I think it does directly undermine the credibility of the executive branch in working with a foreign government. So to summarize this background section, the Supreme Court's question today was, Assuming the plaintiff's complaint is accurate, do they have standing to file a lawsuit against a Border Patrol agent for damages? Now, there were two Supreme Court cases that were being applied here. The first was a decision in the incredibly suspiciously named case of Bivens v. Six Unknown Named Agents of Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Yeah, nothing about
I'm thinking in that case's name. Now, some of those lawyers said Bivens more times than they said the word the in these oral arguments. So this case is central to the arguments today. In this case, coming out of the early there was a guy from Brooklyn who had six narcotics officers raid his apartment without any sort of warrant and arrest him. In response, he decided to sue the officers themselves in federal court for damages. And it worked. The court's decision found that, having concluded that petitioner's complaint states a cause of action under the Fourth Amendment, we hold that petitioner is entitled to recover money damages for any injuries that he has suffered as a result of the agent's violation of the amendment. And with that decision, Americans were now able to get cash money directly from officers who violate their civil rights when no other federal remedy is out there. Now this brings us to the other case that came up a lot today and put a cap on what you can sue officers for regarding damages. The 2017 case of Ziglar v. Abbasi. This case was about arguing on behalf of non-citizens reportedly arrested and detained unjustly as terrorism suspects by the U.S. after 9-11. The defendants in this case include former Attorney General John Ascroft, FBI Director Robert Mueller, and Commissioner of the Immigration and Naturalization Service James Ziegler. In 2002, the government was rounding up suspicious non-citizens without due process and holding them in detention centers for months. While the ethics of this were hashed out in separate cases, the goal here was to directly take on Mueller and Ashcroft to make them pay out personal cash for damages caused by violating constitutional rights. As you can imagine, this argument probably wasn't going to pan out. The Bevins Doctrine was severely handicapped. The courts basically said, wow, these lawsuits are getting a little out of control here. I mean, holding leaders accountable. How can we intervene? In the end, they vowed not to expand Bevins beyond the narrow scope of existing precedent without a ton of new caution. Now, for a new precedent setting Bevins case to win judicial approval, you need to make sure that there isn't a special factor, something that's vaguely defined, that would cause hesitation. It's a bit of a, eh, you'll know it when you see it kind of thing. Only problem, in this case, we don't know if we're seeing it. In that case, the special factor was that we were dealing with national security and executive branch policy makers, not rogue actors. The Supreme Court had to answer these two questions. First, is the context of this case different? And second, if the context is the same, does it have just that special something? The underlying context of this case was well-trodden territory for Bevan's lawsuits. According to the lawsuit, the officer shot a child who was playing, which is a due process violation to the extreme. This falls squarely under the Fourth Amendment violation, similar to the one set by the original Bevins case way back in the 70s in Brooklyn. Everybody on both sides would agree that the family could sue for damages. If the kid was two yards over and on the American side of the border. When this case was first argued to this court two years ago, Counsel for Respondent and Counsel for the United States were both asked whether petitioners would have a Bivens remedy if Sergio Hernandez had been standing on U.S. soil when he was shot and killed by Respondent. Both said yes. The question before this Court today is, therefore, whether a Bivens action is nevertheless foreclosed because, in this case, Sergio was standing a few feet to the Mexican side of the border at the time he was shot. Yes, the underlying question here was whether the fact that the victim was a non-U.S. citizen on the Mexican side of the border would create a special enough special factor to make Bivens not cover this case. Now, some of you might be scratching your head and thinking, well, how is he protected by the Fourth Amendment under these circumstances? The undisputed and assumed argument here was that, by virtue of the fact that this was an American policeman firing from U.S. soil, there was a Fourth Amendment case to be had. If, of course, the lawsuit's complaint was found to be accurate in court. So context? Check. We got that. The overreaching claim is similar to precedent. Now to the special factors. Are they special enough to make this a case that should not be handled in civil court? There are a few potential special factors floating around. As mentioned by the U.S. Attorney, Mr. Wall, boy, that's a fitting name. 
A foreign national was killed on foreign soil by a federal officer patrolling an international border. That is plainly a new context for Bivens' purposes and several special factors counsel hesitation here. Clear foreign relations concerns with Mexico and the need for border security, clear extraterritoriality. Of course, this all leads to some awkward lines of question, because what the justices kept coming back to was the idea that the family could have totally sued the officer, uncontroversially, if the boy was just a few yards over on the other side of the border when he was shot. Usually, the, the, what, the analysis that we go through in a Bivens claim, and I think that this is the analysis that the government wants us to go through, is to ask about, are there special foreign affairs concerns? Are there special national security concerns? And the question is, why would there be special foreign affairs and national security concerns with respect to a shooting that occurs three inches on one side of the border versus three inches on the other side of the border, or even a, a little bit away from the border, but very much involving border security work. The response, like all good Supreme Court answers, is multifold. First, the U.S. and Mexican diplomats are currently trying to work out how exactly to rectify this situation. So for a civil court to just swoop in and start working independent of these negotiations would be, well, really confusing and inconsistent. This inconsistency played a huge part in determining who was in charge because, remember, American official position here is that everything happened by the books. So the potential for contradictory judiciary and executive claims would almost give the appearance that the executive branch doesn't hold Mexican citizens' rights in the highest regard. The problem comes in when you say, yeah, but if the Mexican was on the U.S. side of the border, the government still would have said everything is above board and the lawsuit would have been able to go without question. So how is the situation special or different? Similarly, national security. The argument here is that if we allow a border patrol member to be sued for damages, it would have a chilling effect on our national security border forces because they might now hesitate before shooting non-U.S. citizens on the Mexican side of the border. This somewhat awkward argument was handled by Justice Sotomayor. Doesn't that happen if the shooting happened in our own land? Meaning a border patrol agent who sees a child at play and kills him two feet from the line is not chilled. He knows he can't do that. What makes it chilling to tell a border patrol agent, don't shoot indiscriminately at children standing a few feet from the border. We have to accept the facts of the complaint on their face. Thanks for the reminder. For the purposes of determining whether this lawsuit is valid to even be heard, the kid was just playing on the Mexican side of the border. Also, again, if all of this happened just a few yards over, the argument would be there would now be legal trouble. So this is specifically a cooling effect on border patrol officers shooting unprovoked at a non-US citizen across the border. So this was really the trouble with the case that the US government just kept bumping up against. Sure, the non-citizen was on the Mexican side of the border when he was shot, but what makes that so different from if it was a non-citizen on the U.S. side of the border? Let me tell you, Justice Stephen Breyer went off on the U.S. attorney in a very funny way, arguing that just because this was the first transnational shooting case, that alone wasn't enough to give it a special attribute. It's a long clip, but boy is it maybe the closest you'll get to a gloves off reality TV show argument in Supreme Court coverage. It would be the extending of Bibbins into a new country. Why is it extending? I mean, after it, it, all, maybe in Hawaii, there's never been a Bibbins action brought before on the 14th island. Is that an extension? It, it's not. It's within the United States. Here oh, I, I understand that. And this is on the other side of the line. Also, by the way, it was at 7 o'clock in the evening, exactly 7.02. And there never has been a Bibbins action brought at 7.02. But there's never been a Bivens action that involves a transnational shooting. Ah, I got that point. All I am saying is, why is that different in terms of a problem caused 
than the fact that it was 702.59 on the fourth island of Hawaii. You got my point? I do. Good. Oh, he does. <laughs> Good. There was. What is it? It's, it's. <laughs> Don't ask my point. I want to know your answer. I have to go back to, to it being different in so much as it, it, it is transnational. And it well, you've said that. All I'm asking you is why that makes a difference. So that's what the concern really came down to in this case. Whether just because the kid was shot yards away from the border on the Mexican side, there's enough of a difference to previous precedent setting cases to say that Bivens doesn't apply, and therefore the family can't even file the lawsuit. We're not sure who's going to win until they release a ruling later this summer. Hey, it's been nine years, what's a few more seasons? Now before I leave you, there was one other interesting concern. If we make this a new Bivens precedent, where will it stop? This brought up two scenarios. First, what if this border patrol officer was deep in Mexico on official business when he shot and killed someone there in a rogue action? The response here was… There was no Fourth Amendment protection for a Mexican national whose home was searched by DEA agents operating in conjunction with the Mexican government. Yeah, the Fourth Amendment protection is really contingent on someone having their foot in the United States. In this case, the shooter. This of course brings us to the second concern. Uh, our drones accidentally bomb innocent people a fair amount of the time. Would this make the drone pilot who's in the United States liable for damages caused by the accidental destruction of a city? This argument was resolved because, well, it would be pretty easy to argue a difference in context regarding law enforcement versus the military, and it wouldn't be a rogue actor either, but rather someone presumably working within the policies. So that's the case the Supreme Court just heard regarding the cross-border shooting. This was an incredibly complicated case to summarize. I really leaned on that delete key a lot when writing this episode. So I hope I was able to satisfactorily explain what is going on here. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons, this great group of people over here, for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the legal arguments of the day and join this growing group of individuals, well, there's a link in the description. Remember to subscribe by clicking on this floating logo to the right of my head and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.